All right, well, if you want to open up your word to Matthew chapter 6, we are continuing in a, a study that I kind of didn't intend for it to be this long, but it's just been irresistible to stay in it because it's such helpful stuff from God's word. Uh, all right, but here we are. We are a few weeks into February, so by now, your New Year's resolutions are what? <laughs> Gone? <laughs> Forgotten? Uh, why'd you bring that up? Uh, all right, well, somehow, you and I are waking up on a Monday morning or through the week, and we're trying to figure out some priorities for our lives. We've got some of them written down. We've got some of them that we just wing. Uh, there's things that we focus on, you know, maybe for you it's, you wanted to be healthier this year, so you created some space in your life to eat healthier, create some kind of a workout plan, or maybe it was a budget for your family, you just wanted to stay on budget this year, and so you learned some things there, you're focused on that, maybe you just got a hobby you're interested in, you just wanted to do better in that area. Listen, at some point in our lives, I'm going to use this word today, we're, we're going to become experts at something. Right. Uh, maybe you're a young family, young parents, and, and you're having children, and those little ones are forcing you to become an expert at being a parent. I mean, I got children, and I was clueless about a lot of the details. I just kind of knew generally, okay, so you feed them and watch them grow. I mean, is that what you do? Uh, and then I learned, no, there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, but you're going to become an expert at something. And what's that going to be? What are you going to be an expert in. What are you going to have some kind of above average level of knowledge and insight into when you go to live your life? Right, now, if you're not careful, the, the world is pressing on you to fill up the list of what that needs to be. Here's what you need to be an expert in. Here's what you need to know a lot about and be really good at. But we have been kind of captured by this prayer. This, the, we, it's become known as the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer that was taught to them by the Lord. But what's unique about this is Jesus takes two opportunities in the Gospels to give a very limited script to his disciples. And he says, here's your prescription, if you will. When you pray, focus on these areas. Make these issues the priority that you're going to have conversation on a regular basis with the Father about. Here we go. Right? So then he gives this list, this list for us to be experts, if you will, in. So each one of these categories, you and I are to have some occupying, influential level of knowledge about that is really helping us to live our lives for the glory of God, right? So I put that list quickly together. We can't go back and review all these. But when you open this prayer with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right? When we start there, we're starting in the right place. We're becoming experts on the person of God. And remember, these are not phrases meant to be uttered over and over and over again to where all we're doing is just using that same phrase. These are, these are tickle points. These are, these are topics for us to open up and to develop a library on them. Right? So you ought to have like a whole bookshelf dedicated to each one of these in my heart and in my knowledge, that I know something about the person of God. Right? How many of you guys know you, you, you probably had a conversation this past week with somebody that sounded somewhat like this? Well, you know, if that's what God is like, I, I can't believe in a God who's like that. Or, you know, I, I, how can you believe in a God who's like that? Well, it's almost as though people get shocked to hear that God is like something. He is a certain way. You don't get, just get to fill it in and make him up. Well, what is he like? Do you have like books on your shelf that specialize in, in how amazingly loving and caring and sacrificial God is? And do you have books on your shelf that highlight that he is holy and he's like nothing else? So he's not some cheap version of love like we have. He is an unbelievable display of love. And he is radically pure in a way that maybe we haven't even bothered to know about. That's who he is. Jesus says, make sure you're an expert in that. Know this kind of stuff well. Know, know that you live in kingdoms. There's an earthly kingdom. There's a heavenly kingdom. There's a kingdom right now you experience. There's a kingdom that's coming. Know something about that. So when life comes at you and it feels like, whoo, this feels a certain way. Well, can you explain that to your own soul? 
from the standpoint of, of what does this mean by way of the kingdom? You know, too many of us get very disillusioned and confused because we read the Bible and we don't understand. Some of it is describing a kingdom that is yet to come fully. We want it to come, but it's not here fully yet. And so we're standing around waiting for that kingdom to show up exactly like it's described, but that, that's in heaven what you're reading about. That's not even for here fully yet. Well, do I know that? Or do I just let life wash over me and knock me to the ground and go, why, why is stuff broken? What is the deal? I thought if I trusted God, I thought if I was a Christian, right, well, this, these prayers are helping us. The awareness of our needy condition. God, give us this day daily bread. I need daily stuff from you. I need to be an expert in my condition that I am a creature in need. I need to know something about that. And then there's these last three little categories that I'm kind of bunched together. Last week, Peter introduced us to this issue of forgiveness and our being forgiven and our need to forgive others. Well, where, where does that come from? Well, forgiveness gets birthed out of a world with sin in it, a world where I sin and need forgiveness. And, and by the way, other people sin and will probably need to be forgiven by me. I need to be an expert in that. But how many of us are just shocked? Somebody sinned against us. <gasps> you know, we're freaking out. We got to go see counselors and we got to go talk to people like, oh, I can't believe someone did something against me. Well, really? Did, did you, have you ever heard of this prayer? <laughs> it frames that you're going to sin against other people. You don't think they're going to sin against you? Are you in touch with those things? We're novices in categories that matter. We're supposed to be experts in this stuff. And then today we're going to talk about sin and temptation. We're supposed to be experts in the field of temptation and what it's like to live in this world where temptation is present and where evil is present. And what's interesting here, these, these last three, right? The first ones, you know, can kind of sound attractive in some ways. The last three, that they're just mired in the brokenness of our world. They're, they're about sin. They're about the need for forgiveness. They're about temptations to do the wrong thing. They're about evil that's present. So, you know, I've kind of broken these into sort of headings, but it would look like if these headings are anywhere accurate, three out of the six have to do with some rather unpleasant news in our lives. And, and, I don't know, maybe you don't have a stomach for that. Maybe you don't want to go there. Can we not talk so much about sin and temptation and our need to pursue forgiveness and to be can we not talk about all that stuff? Can we talk about something positive? You know, we've got a future. God has a destiny for us. Discover your gifts. Be all that God made you to be. Can't we talk about that more? Well, I didn't write this prayer. Right? But you are paying attention to it. There's a little bit of a balance here, isn't there? You know, because I know it's much more popular and I could attract a much better audience, maybe not better, but bigger, if I could just tell you about how to be a better you. You know, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Just discovering how to be a better you, how to write your ticket, how to have your future, how to arrive, man, how to, in this world to prosper and be awesome. All right, well, you find that for me in this prayer. Now, it's there in a very healthy way. But it's not there in the way you hear it today. And so half of this prayer gets absorbed in, hey, I want my people to be experts in dealing with sin and temptation because that's still the kingdom of this world that you're living in. And you might need to be really, really, really good at it. Right? Well, interesting, we're not the only ones who aren't really interested in that topic. John Owen, one of the Puritan writers, wrote this in 1658. So we're going back a few years. And apparently they didn't have much of an interest in this category either. He says, but now, reader, if you are among them who takes no notice of these things or cares not for them, who has no sense of the efficacy and dangers of temptations in your own walking and profession, nor has observed the power of them upon others, who discerns not the manifold advantages that they have got in these days, wherein all things are shaken, nor has been troubled, or moved by the sad successes they have had among professors, but supposes that all things are well <laughs> within doors and without, and would be better could you obtain fuller satisfaction to some of your lusts and the pleasure or profits of the world. 
I desire you to know that I write not for you, nor do I esteem you a fit reader or judge of what is here written. <laughs> it's a little edgy, isn't he? He that understands not, listen clearly, that there is an hour of temptation come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This person is doubtless either himself at present captivated under the power of some woeful lust, corruption, or temptation, or is indeed stark blind and knows not at all what it is to serve God in temptations. Right, so if I'm picking on a subject here that you got no interest in, I'm not really interested in learning much about temptation and giving in to sin. I'm not, I'm not really all that interested in. Well, according to Mr. Owen, that's either because you're already too postured in the land of sin and gotten quite comfortable with it and it's not something you're worried about. Or you're just really not paying attention to all around you, somebody this past week gave in to temptation. And it did what temptation does. It made way for sin. And sin, when it accomplishes its purpose, brings forth death. So all around you, somebody moved toward death in something in their life by making room for temptation. And if you didn't notice that, then, then you're, you're becoming more absorbed in personal elements of this world than in the corporate dimension of God's kingdom coming in people's lives. This is affecting their kingdom. Now, in our modern setting, John Piper comments on this volume that was written years ago by John Owen. He says, I rejoice at this publication of John Owen's works on the nature of our battle with sin. As I look across the Christian landscape, I think it's fair to say concerning sin, quote, they have healed the wound of my people lightly. That's what the prophet Jeremiah said. I take this to refer to leaders who should be helping the church know and feel the seriousness of indwelling sin and how to fight it and kill it. Instead, the depth and complexity and ugliness and danger of sin in professing Christians is either minimized, since we're already justified, or it's psychologized as a symptom of our woundedness rather than our corruption. This is tragically light healing. I call it tragedy because, listen, by making life easier for ourselves and minimizing the nature and seriousness of our sin, we become greater victims of it. We are, in fact, not healing ourselves. And listen, as we deal with temptation today, there's an, there's an allurement, there's an attractiveness into something that's sinful. There is always a price to be paid to say yes to temptation. And the weighty destructive forces of that price in our, in our lives, do we really want to be free from those things? I think most of us, all of us would say, yes, I want to be free from them. Well, our freedom begins when we take temptation seriously because temptation is, is an introduction to us to sin. Temptation is an invitation that comes in the mail in some form for us just to consider. Might we consider sin? Well, that's the best point for us to win. Any step in that direction, it only becomes more difficult by degrees. The greatest moment for any of us to be victorious over sin is when temptation introduces the sin to us. At that moment, you, you've got your best moment. Any cooperation after that doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it harder. And many of us would have story after story to tell where we just kept walking and it began to overtake us. All right, here's our question about being an expert, are you an expert in understanding sin and temptation? Have you had any specialized training in this area that allows you to greet each day with an awareness of how sin and temptation will be at work in and around you today? Well, today you get a chance to get an introduction to this. I'm not going to make you an expert, but at least we'll get introduced a little bit to it. And we get introduced to this through this prayer and through the specific wording that is here. Matthew 6, verse 13, Jesus says to pray this. He says, pray to God and say, lead us not into temptation. And then we'll deal 
next, in the coming weeks, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. What, what exactly is this describing? Uh, well, I'm going to let Charles Spurgeon help us a little bit with this particular word. The word is an interesting word in, in the Greek. It can go into a couple of different directions. So it can, it can be used for temptations, but it's also used elsewhere for trials. But how is it being used here? Well, Mr. Spurgeon would say the word here used for temptation is not the word constantly written when trial is meant. It's just the very word which one would employ if temptation to sin were intended. And I cannot believe that any other translation can meet the, the case. Doddridge's paraphrase is a happy one. Do not bring us into circumstances of pressing temptation lest our virtue should be vanquished and our souls endangered by them. But if we must be thus tried, do thou graciously rescue us from the power of the evil one. Right, so what we're looking at in this lead us not into temptation is it, it's a word that can be used for trials and suffering and difficulty. But when you encounter trials and suffering and difficulty in the scripture, it's a positive word. Now it doesn't feel real positive, but the explanations for it are positive. Because trials are tend to, they're, they're like heat in a refiner's pot. They, they bring forth the impurities so that they can be removed and they strengthen us. So trials and suffering actually improve us, bring us to a greater place with more depth in God and greater faith at the end of that. That's not what this is about. No one should be praying those things away. I know I try to avoid them, but we're not supposed to pray them away. God, don't, don't let anything come into my life that's going to refine my faith and make me stronger. Okay, I don't think God wants you praying that way. But there is something here about temptation, and this would be temptation that leads to sin. Now, now God's not interested in us running down the road of sin. Because down the road of sin is not strengthened health improvement. There is death down somewhere down the road of sin, right? We'll see that in a minute. But let's look at the way this word is used in a a few places. And really today, I I wanna give us some insights on the nature of temptation. You and I awake every morning facing temptation. So I, I couldn't be dealing with a subject today that's more real to any of us here today. This is not like, oh man, why don't you preach on something that's relevant to where we are? Uh, we awaken to temptations on a daily basis in a variety of forms. So I just wanted to bring us some insights into what, this, what, what is temptation and, and what can we understand about it. Matthew chapter 26, this word is used again, verse 41. They've gathered in Gethsemane. It's the final hour of Jesus' life with his disciples. And he tells them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? So all kinds of insights here for us. John Owen says, now they are not properly the temptations of God as something from him with his end upon them that are here intended. It is temptation in its special nature as it denotes an active efficiency toward sinning. Right? Jesus is he's saying, watch and pray that you not enter into something that leads into further sin. Be careful about that. Watch. Pray in that setting. So here's a couple of things that we learn. Right? That you not enter into temptation. So at some point, they haven't entered temptation. Right? So Jesus is saying, hey, hey you're good right here. But as you move in this direction, you begin to enter into temptation. It's almost like Jesus on the highway installs a sign that says, warning, temptation zone ahead. And so I need to be aware of that. I need to be aware that there are, there are settings, places, time zones, relational zones, something I'm going to step into that I, I wasn't in a moment ago, but I am now in it. And maybe temptation, obviously, it can come to us as well. So I think this zone can move toward us. And, and we've got some responsibility in that. If it's moving toward me, I've got a responsibility to move away from it. Because I don't want to find myself in temptation zone. Jesus didn't want them to find themselves in temptation zone. So he's warning them about this setting. And then he informs them about themselves. This is so helpful. Here's one reason why you don't want to find yourself in temptation zone. 
Because, hey, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak and vulnerable. Now, I, I don't know how you do with that. I don't know how you do with self-awareness. You know, and unfortunately, self-awareness for most of us just means uh, our opinions of ourselves or the opinions of others about ourselves. But you know, your first self-awareness needs to start with what the Bible says about you. Right? Before you kind of fall in love with people thinking something of you, why am I letting the Bible say what it says about you? Right? The Bible reveals things that are just critical because it's right. Your friends, friends might be flattering you. You might be hearing things that they're really not saying. There's a lot of self-assessment that we don't do real well, but this is absolutely accurate. So for every one of us, there's some kind of temptation zone. And Jesus is saying, you know what? When you, when you cross that and you enter the zone of temptation, what you take with you, yeah, is a, is a spirit that's willing, but a flesh that is weak and vulnerable. And that's true for every one of us. No matter how long you've known Christ, no matter how awesome the work of God is in your spirit, you take with you a flesh that is weak. So, so be aware of that when you're deciding, hey, I know, you know, whatever category of your life, and I, I want you to think about that for a second because we're going to end the service making this real for us. So even be thinking, what, what are the temptations that you face? What's temptation zone for you, right? So, okay, so here's this temptation zone, this land of temptation, and I'm, I'm getting really close to it. All right, so my question is, if you're aware of this inherent fleshly weakness, how, how close to that do you want to get? All right, because at some point, I don't think there's really a bold line for temptation, by the way. I think it's more of a faded line. It's sort of like where light and shadow begins. It's kind of just a diminishing of light a little bit. It doesn't kind of boldly put up a fence and say, all right, please use the key and the combination to cross now into temptation zone. Uh, I think you just kind of find yourself, you've drifted into it and you're way too far in all of a sudden. But it, that might be helped by me deciding at some point, given my knowledge of me, that I know that my flesh is weak in particular categories, how close to that do I want to get? Well, this is helpful, isn't it? This is insightful about what temptation is like. And then we're offered some, some help in this. He says, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. So there's activity for us. When we go to face temptation, it's not just a matter of, boy, I sure hope that God pulls me out of the bad spot if I get tempted. Well, the Bible says, no, watch and pray that you won't enter in to temptation. So I get a tip here. That if I'm, I'm kind of losing in the temptation category, probably long ago I started losing in the watching and praying category. So practically speaking, I just can't say, hey, don't give in to temptation. Well, Jesus' way of not giving in to temptation was watch and pray so that you don't enter into this zone of temptation. Luke chapter 4. Verse 13, we get an interesting setting here. It's the end of Jesus' 40-day fast in the wilderness. So he is not eaten for 40 days. He's physically, probably emotionally, a lot about the humanity of him is, being, is at its edge. It's worn. It's challenged in an unusual way here. And in chapter 4 of Luke, verse 13, it says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time, right? So some great insights here in this passage about temptation. When he had ended every temptation, and remember Jesus got, he had to face three, what I'll say, unique temptations, right? A temptation to turn rocks into bread, right? and he was tempted to kind of take a shortcut to having all the kingdoms become his, right? Don't go to the cross. Don't, no, no, don't, don't do that. Just, if you'll just real quick just kneel, kneel before me. I'll give you all that. Right? And his third temptation was to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple in order to provide God with an opportunity to rescue him. Right? So these are the temptations. Right? Wayne Grudem says the essence of these temptations was an attempt to persuade Jesus to escape from the hard path of obedience and suffering that was appointed for him as the Messiah. The temptation was to use his divine power to cheat a bit on the requirements and make obedience somewhat easier. 
Well, here's a few quick lessons. I won't spend much time in these. Insight number one, the devil is a source of temptation. When Jesus was in the wilderness, specifically, we learn, the devil came and tempted him. Second, uh, the devil is not always present and active. And, and more than likely, I don't know if I could actually prove this at all, but more than likely, probably none of us have ever been tempted by the devil himself. I just don't think any of us are all that important. <laughs> He's a limited creature. He is somewhere in God's creation at this very moment. But he's not everywhere. And he interacts with somebody, but he's not interacting with everybody all the time. So even Jesus, he came and went from. So when you and I are encountering temptation, there are spiritual forces that bring temptation with them. We have that in this passage. Satan is one of the spiritual forces that bring temptation. So be aware. Okay, now you're loading up your understanding here a little bit, becoming a little bit better expert on temptation because you just found out a moment ago that you got a problem inside of you. This flesh has something called a weakness in it. So temptation is going to come at some point, and if it's just your flesh you're depending upon, you're not going to have the strength to get it off of you. It's going to prevail. But not only do you have a problem with your flesh, but apparently there are spiritual forces that participate in temptation as well. So when temptation comes to you, there could be a, fear, a fierce spiritual force behind that temptation that is unusual, just like there was here. Insight three there. The devil is strategic and he's seeking an opportune or a vulnerable time. That's what this passage says. He found an opportune time. It's 40 days of Jesus bringing physically his body to a place of weakness and vulnerability. Emotionally, whatever else was in his humanity after 40 days in the wilderness, it's, it's not at its brightest point. That's when I'm coming, the devil says. I'll meet you right there. All right, I, don't, I don't know what moment is right for you and for me. Right. There, there are moments where things happen in our lives that kind of pull us down physically, pull us down emotionally. There are seasons in your life where physiologically you're going to get pulled down. Right? Your body's going to change. And, and you are going to feel that in a certain way that's going to pull you down. Be aware. Right? Be an expert in this. When you are at your weakest, the devil's not having sympathy for you. He knows nothing about sympathy. He only searches for vulnerability. You've never imagined such a cruel, hateful creature. You could be going, you could get eight bad news items in a row that are just devastating your world. That's not the moment where the devil's going to go, hey, why don't, you, why don't you leave poor Keith alone for right now? He's just, I mean, he's just crying, he's hurting. Look, even I'm not going to, you know, no. He's waiting for that moment. He loves that moment. And he brings temptation and he takes temptation zone and he shoves it right up against your heels. And he wants you to take a step into it. Last insight in this passage. Temptations are tailor-made for the one being tempted. These were not one-size-fits-all temptations. Right? I, I'll say this in the end. I'm not anticipating. I don't get up in the morning and going, oh, Lord, just, just help me. I know today I'm going to be really tempted to turn rocks into bread. I just know it. I just know it. <laughs> so I'm gearing up in that category. I'm studying, you know. I'm being careful. I'm praying in that area a lot. No, no I'm not. Because the, the tailor-made temptations that are going to come to me are going to be about me. They're going to visit me where I am. They're going, to, they're going to engage who I am. These were tailor-made for the Messiah. These are mess up the Messiah temptations. These are get him to interact supernaturally, bring his power to bear in a way that the Father didn't lead him to do it. Just, you know, just step out of the sense that Jesus did only what the Father does. Well, step out of that for a moment. Turn this into bread. Right? And, and you know that long, horrible pathway to the cross and then the kingdoms are given over to you? Look, you can have them now. Right? This is Messiah temptations. I want to mess up the Messiah. Well, when temptation comes to us, it wants to mess us up wherever we are and whoever we are. 
Look at this last passage here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, right? You can fall into temptation zone, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, right? Insight. Certain desires and ambitions and cravings make us more vulnerable to temptation. Right, so this is not just about temptation zone. This is about the desires that are in us that make us stand really close to temptation zone. How aware am I of that? Am I aware that inside of me, you know, if I didn't teach at all about temptations today, am I aware that there are cravings and desires inside of me that make me pick up and move in my address to right next door to temptation zone? Why are you standing right here? Because I want something. And I want it bad. And I know, you know, way over there, that's not for me and that's not good. But, oh, man, this desire in me. Okay, listen, if you got a desire like that in you, and, and by the way, we all do. Some of them look really innocent. Some of them look really nasty. But they're all in us. And so if you've got a desire like that, there's this temptation. It's going to come to you like a brochure in the mail. And it's going to... You know, the water is crystal clear and blue and you've never seen such white shimmering beaches in your life. Okay, just, just remember, temptation is a brochure. You know how easy it is to print a lying brochure? You get them in the mail all the time. You decide to go ahead and book a reservation at that place and you find out this is like Roach Motel Central. <laughs> It's a toxic wasteland. I mean, look, look at the land that's described here. Now, this is not the land that the guy who desires to be rich, he's seen a brochure. The rich brochure looks awesome. I can't wait to be that. But then you peel back and you stand in the land of rich and it's full of snares, senselessness, harmfulness, ruin, destruction, Right? That's what's in the actual land, but the brochure never announces those things. Now, the Bible does. All right, so I just got exposed to, okay, here's this initial step. So, oh my gosh, the welcome. There's a, there's a band. I mean, they're serving cocktails. This is unbelievable. How, how could I not want to come in? I know this is temptation zone, but still, wow. Okay, well, just beyond the movie set is reality. And the Bible's telling you about reality. And it's warning you that what looks really, really attractive when you first take your first few steps into it, at the end, it's going to be filled with things that feel like snares, senselessness, harm, ruin, destruction. It's not in the brochure. But it's in the Bible. And I can be an expert in what's in the Bible. And boy, that will help me in the day of temptation. Let me give you some quick insights on the nature of temptation Itself. This word, temptation, it means the incitement of desire or craving in somebody. Webster calls it a strong urge or a desire to have or do something. Now listen, this is, this is what makes temptation powerful. Because you and I, we're not neutral about things that are tempting to us. We are inclined to them. We're bent towards them. We want them. And there's an urgency and a craving inside of us. All right, if none of that stuff exists, then it's not a temptation for you. All right, so this word only kicks in when the reality is there are certain internal conditions going on inside of me. That I'm tempted to this because I already have something in me that was wanting that. And now you're tempting me with it. All right, James 1 highlights this word. He says, let... No one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted, listen, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Lured and enticed by his own desire. And that's an interesting little word here. And look what it goes on and says. Then desire when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. All right, now this is not trials, is it? Trials end in refining in a better faith. This is different. 
This ends in death. And what's interesting here is there is this, this word here. It's, 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 it's to lure by bait. Right? Something baits us. But for something to bait a fish, right? I mean, when we, you, know, you guys don't like, you know, you had a great Thanksgiving dinner. You're going fishing the next day. You don't bring like an apple pie with you and throw it in, you know, right? Hopefully you don't. It doesn't work real well. What do you, what do, you do? Well, you find that which the fish already has a desire for. That's how temptation works. It finds what you already have a desire for. And it allures you and it baits you to respond to it. So here's a key element here. And I I hope hope several things will be helpful. But this is a very key to understanding and dealing with temptation. For each of us personally, making this personal, not just some category that we're all talking about neutrally, but personally for me, here's a key. Your temptations are connected to your desires. Your temptations, whatever they are, are connected to your desires, right? So the great question for you to wrestle through humbly this morning is, so what is it that you want What are you craving? What do you have strong desires for already? Well, that's where you're going to be fighting the temptation zone. It's going to come to you in that kind of category. Here, let's catch this from biblical history here. John Owen says, temptation may proceed either singly from Satan or the world or other men in the world or from ourselves or jointly from all or some of them in their several combinations, right? The classic view of temptation is that temptation in, involves the flesh, the world, and the devil. Right? Classically, that's the, the view. And I think that's a good understanding. So when temptation interacts with us, there's the flesh, there's something in us, there's the world, there's something for us out there, and then there's the devil who just ratchets it all up and pours gasoline on the fire and makes it all the more a roaring experience. Right, look at these passages in 1 John chapter 2 real quick. Verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, look at these three things that get highlighted here. There's three things highlighted. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride in possessions. It's not from the Father, but it's from the world. Now, interesting, that's 1 John chapter 2. This is like 60-something A.D. when that's written. But we can go all the way back to the first moment where sin entered the scene and find this verse. This is what Eve encountered in the garden. This verse. John, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that, look at the three things. The tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. That the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Then she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband and he ate. Right? See, this is, this is the nature of temptation. It appeals to these pieces of us. And so Satan used bait on her. He baited her. He baited her not with stuff that she didn't give a rip about. She wasn't interested at all. He baited her with things that were appealing to her. Things that her her eyes could see the pleasantness of it. She She could taste that fruit. Her flesh found pleasure. I know that I know there's pleasure in that. I just I could feel it. But what he sold her on was pride. Now all three are in this temptation. But he sells her on pride, right? This is gonna make you something, Eve. You eat this and you are going to become something. Pride. And so here's here's the question for us. At some point in our lives, it's, it's not sufficient for us to have some general knowledge of this topic. Like, you know, generally, we understand generally out there, temptation operates a certain way. There's the world, the flesh, and the devil. I got it all. I need to know specifically how it operates in me. Because this is just a reality. 
There are some things in this world that, that, are, that are tempting to me. Tempting. Tempted by that. And then there are other things in this world that are tempting to me. And they are totally different in me interacting with them. I feel the impact. I feel the allurement. I fight them differently. Because not everything tempts you the same way. This is where I, you know, I think that, and an injustice gets done here. Let me just sidetrack us for a second. We're, we're a community of people. This is the kind of stuff we need to learn. Because we don't do well in this. Here's what we do. I take my categories where I'm tempted like this and I pick up how that feels and I bring them over here and I put them in your categories where you're tempted like this. And I go, why can't you deal with this? Why are you struggling in this area? Why don't you just stop? Well, that works for you and it works for me too in the temptations that are like this to me. I could take them or leave them. It offers me some kind of pleasure, offers me some sense of pride, some self-improvement. But you know, it's really not all that much and it's really not in the categories that I want anyway. So yeah, I guess technically I'm tempted if I worked it up a little bit. But over here, these are enormous in me and I struggle with them and I fail at them and they win and I can't stand it. What an awesome community we'd be if we understood that about each other. That we wouldn't just greet somebody else's failure in their categories that are like this with our explanation for these categories. Because you, if you're in touch with, if you're, you're really playing the Christian game here, you're in touch that you've got some of these too. And you might have nice ones. Right? They're cleaned up. They're well behaved. They went to college, wear a tie. They're nice. <laughs> So you're not even embarrassed to confess them in covenant group. I mean, it's like, these are tidy ones. Just be careful. When I read the Bible, I think God is more offended by unbelief and anxiety than he is perhaps by drug use. Does that surprise you? Because, you know, if I, you know well, I'm, a, I'm a druggie, man. I'm, I'm using some drugs here. All right, there's probably some reasons behind that we want to get at the heart of that. But, you know, you just might be this person who's just a thrill seeker. Oh, man, just a thrill seeker, man. I just, you know, I just decided to try this. Listen, the person who wrestles with doubt stares at a circumstance and stares at God and does this. God, you are inefficient, too small, and can't handle this. So I am freaking out. No, which one of those do you think insults God's more? But if you sit in your covenant group and you express, oh, I'm so worried about something. You know, I'm, I'm so bothered. This might happen or that might. Everybody's like, no, I know. I understand. We're fine. But standing there mooning and saying, yeah, I shot up heroin the other night. <gasps> <laughs> How do you do that? What are you thinking? Uh, all right. I'm not for heroin use. All right. Don't get me wrong here. It creates a whole different set of problems. But, you know, your sins are not as tidy as you think they are. And you're tempted to things that are offensive to God. They're just offensive to him. For us to find him unworthy, I don't think there's a worse thing you can say to God. So be careful that how we handle our sins and, and know ourselves. John Piper says this about John Owen's writing. He says, when our people have not been taught well about the real nature of sin and how it works and how to put it to death, most of the miseries people report are not owing to the disease, but its symptoms. They feel a general malaise and don't know why their marriages are breaking at a breaking point. They feel weak in their spiritual witness and devotion. Their workplace is embattled. Their church is tense with unrest. Their fuse is short with their children, etc. They report these miseries as if they were the disease. And they want the symptoms removed. We proceed to heal the wound lightly. We look first and mainly for circumstantial causes for the misery, present or past. If we're good at it, we find partial causes and give some relief. Listen, listen. you know, at some point here, you and I are bumping into these surfacey symptomatic issues. Right? And, and you know, at some point, you're going to have a real knockdown, drag out fight with your spouse, and you're going to come in for counseling because we're having conflict. I'm in a conflict, or your, your kids are acting out in some really 
way that's really destructive, bad thing. So, you know, this is critical. We're going to come. Can, you know, th- those are symptoms of something deeper. There's a reason why you have, have built a fortress and you have borrowed a howitzer from Germany to aim at your wife. There's a reason why you're doing that. That's the real issue. What is it that's driving you to say the things that you're saying, the way you're saying, what is it you're trying to protect in that moment? That's where the real temptation is. Real temptation is in the end, hey, can you give us some instruction on how to better communicate? Well, that'll help a little bit. You know, it'd be nice if you stop cursing each other out or threatening each other or bringing up the worst thing about them that you can possibly bring up. But the real question is, why are you doing that? And we don't want to know that. And we don't want to go there. So, you know, we bring our, we come in, you know, our kids, you know, how do, how do, we, how do we parent this? You know, how do, we, how do we correct that behavior? How do we deal with that? Uh, I, well, at some level, we got to do that. But do we know that temptation operates at a deeper level than that? That there's something specifically about me that I'm craving and I'm wanting and I'm desiring that temptation's going after that. And it just happens to be manifesting itself in these categories. And most of the time, what we deal with is circumstantial. Well, he came home from work the other night, and then he said that, and then he brought up this. It's all circumstantial, isn't it? It's the report about that event and what happened in specific details about that circumstance. Oh, and maybe, maybe you're going to bring up your past, right? Maybe you're going to say, and I was raised this way, and he was raised this way, and I just, you know, and, and so now we've got some circumstances to explain why this circumstance over here happened. We still haven't dealt with the fact that, well, what was it about your past circumstances that you begin to want something so bad because of something that happened, you developed a craving and a desire that now temptation can throw some bait out and you're on board just like that. It's not just the words that you said, not just the event in the moment. It was temptation at a much deeper level. And I don't know if we want to know that about ourselves, but we have to. We need to be experts in temptation, specifically in what tempts us. All right, question, how well do I know how cravings and ambitions and fears are operating in me? I am most vulnerable to temptation when temptation touches what I'm going to call the moving motivators in my life. All right, that's when I'm the v- most vulnerable to temptation. When temptation decides to reach in and touch something that's already a moving motivator. I'm, I'm already in motion in this category of my life. Right? And I'm mean, either in motion for one of two reasons. I mean, it's either a pleasure motivator. I'm seeking the pleasure of something in my life. Right? I don't know if I wrote this out in your outline. But pleasure motivators, they motivate me out of a sense of pleasure and reward, comfort, a desirable condition. I can see something that I'm going to enjoy. There's something in this for me. I'm going to move toward it. So I'm already kind of leaning. My weight's already in that direction. I'm interested. I like this thing over here. Temptation comes along and it just... Oh, it's just really easy to go in that direction because I'm already moving. And then there are fear motivators. And they motivate me out of a sense of loss or threat or danger or destruction or pain. And and they are to be avoided at all costs. And I wake up in the morning with these pleasure motivators and fear motivators in my life and the second I, I, I don't want my life to become that, I don't want to be like that. I don't be, want to be around that person. I don't want to be vulnerable in this moment. I don't want to be embarrassed by that. I don't want my shame to be discovered. Those are all fear motivators. And so temptation has a very easy day when it decides to motivate me by using those because I'm already moving. I've already made my mind up. I am not going there. So I'm, I'm already kind of away from that thing. So whether God's called me to do that, whether God's called me to have faith and trust him, whether God says, this is not about your reputation, Keith, it's about mine. So go stand over there. You might be embarrassed by standing over there, but how about being so free from yourself and so in love with my glory that you can stand right there? Oh, I'm terrified. I I, I don't want to look like I'd fail. I don't want to look unintelligent. Whatever. Whatever. So I'm already moving away from that thing and sin comes along, temptation comes along and helps me move further. Are you aware that this stuff is operating inside of you? Are you going to wake up on Monday morning and there are going to be pleasure motivators waiting for you and there are going to be fear motivators waiting for you? And temptation is going to land in those places. So if you apply this somewhere, apply it in the places that are real in our lives. 
One last thought. Um, Kurt, you can go ahead and start coming back up here. Let's listen to this thought from J.I. Packer. He says, watch, in that watch and pray dimension, watch suggests a soldier on guard, alert for the first signs of enemy attack. We watch, right? What are we watching for? We watch against temptation by noting what situation, what company and influence expose us to it and avoiding them whenever we can. As Luther said, you can't stop the birds flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. He <laughs> says, find out what for you is fire and don't play with it. Find out what for you is fire. Please, can we not be a church who's a specialist in what everybody else is struggling with? Husbands and wives, go ahead and just close volume eight on your spouse that you've written, that you know so much about why they do what they do and why they don't do what they do and everything that's wrong with them. And can we just begin to be specialists in me? Find out what for me is fire. What's going to be combustible for me? What's going to tempt me? What's working and moving inside of me already so that when temptation comes, it's going to come to that place. That's where it's going to show up. It comes to that door all the time. It's not enough just to have a general knowledge in this category. Matter of fact, I'd say the, the great help in this, you know, lead us not into temptation. Look, this is about me walking with you. This is about me living in your purpose. God, what do I know about me in this? Here's what I want to do in closing out our time together. I want to create an atmosphere where we can watch and pray for a moment. But I want to get you to watch in particular categories. Right? So I've put three categories there that you might want to explore in your own heart. Right? Remember the categories that Eve had to face. There was a dimension where it was good for food. There was something that appealed pleasure-wise. You've got taste buds. You've got You've got pleasure sensors all over the place. In your brain, in your, in your physical organs, God wired you to enjoy things. So there's going to be temptation in those categories. This temptation in the garden was a delight to the eyes. There, there was something to look at that was tantalizing and capturing. And then it was, it was good to make you something. This, that'll make me something. That'll advance me. All right, so let me just pick on those three categories and, and you stop listening to what I'm saying. You start listening for you. I want you to figure out which of these three, maybe all of them, but which of these three in particular are going to be the door where temptation is going to come to this door for you more than some of the others, right? So how about this? A temptation to make me something. I'm motivated and tempted by things that are going to make me something to achieve something, to obtain something, to conquer, to create a reputation for myself, to impress others, to advance my name, to find some sense of uniqueness about who I am. If that's my category, then the most challenging temptations will be in areas that offer me self-advancement, some kind of personal increase in the eyes of others. And you'll make decisions and you'll be lured by things because you already have that craving in you. I want to be somebody. I don't want to be nobody. I want to stick out. If there's 10 people in the room, I, I want to be in at least the top three in whatever the category is. I want to be a top three athlete. I want to be top three musician. I want to be top three smart person. I want to be top three funny guy. Did I hit your category yet? I'm motivated by that, right? I'm going to be tempted in that area. How about sensory pleasure motivators? If I'm motivated by sensory pleasure, sight, touch, physical sensation, something to be experienced physically, then my most challenging temptations will be in areas that offer me sensory pleasure. Sexual temptations, drug and alcohol temptations, laziness, low demand temptations, overeating temptations. Because if for me, pleasure is what I crave, then I'm already leaning toward those things. 
The temptation to step into them is pretty easy. What about fear and anxiety motivators? If I'm motivated by security or safety, avoiding the unexpected, avoiding loss, avoiding feeling vulnerable or threatened, avoiding a sense of inadequacy, well, then my most challenging temptations will be things like control and manipulation and making sure I take a conservative step in everything that I do with conservative reasons to explain why I've taken a conservative step. And it sounds so right until your heart gets exposed and you're terrified to fail. And that's what's really tempting you. All right, now notice, your temptations are going to be unique, right? The guy who's really, really careful, he doesn't want anything to go wrong. He doesn't want anything to fail. He's totally different than the first guy who's motivated ambitiously because he wants a name for himself. That guy take risks. He'll volunteer for stuff. Oh, I, I can do that. I can do that. You know, he, maybe he can't do that, but he doesn't. For him, the risk of being embarrassed isn't as good as the advancement I might get out of doing this. Totally different motivators in these categories. But somewhere in here is us. So can we just take a moment for you to let, let the Holy Spirit find you in this, right? I just don't want us to learn about the topic of temptation. But in these three categories, and then there's definitely more, these are just three ways that I thought to say this to us. Can you just let the Holy Spirit find you right now? God, we do it. We just invite you, Lord, into the realities of the lives that we're living, into the feelings that we have, the thoughts that we have, the way we're doing things. God, we live facing temptation. That can be said of all of us, but Lord, there's something specific that can be said about each of us. Lord, unlike you, I, I don't anticipate this week I will be offered the kingdoms of this world if I'll just bow down. But Lord, I'm going to be tempted because there's some things in me that sin and the enemy can appeal to. Lord, maybe they're in these categories. God, right now, would you move in our hearts and in our lives and would you teach us about us. attention to how does God remedy this how does God meet us in a way that will make a difference in these categories in our lives where temptation is so near I'll put two thoughts there at the end of your outline that we are rescued by remembering we get rescued from temptation by remembering temptation comes in some form of thought it's offering you something it's communicating something to us and there's something that God has communicated and revealed so temptation is revealing something in its brochure but God has revealed something to us and so in that moment we need to remember remember this that sin is a substitute for what God has called good for us so if in whatever category sin comes and it's tempting, it is, it is seeking to take the place of something that God has called good for us. So to say yes to that sin, I'm going to say no to what God called good. 
So in the Garden of Eden, that was Eve's downfall, wasn't it? God had called good what Satan called lacking. The brochure said, it's not going to be good enough. You have to decide. Is the brochure accurate? Or is God accurate? And to decide that, I'm going to need to know what God said. I'm going to need to be an expert in what God has said. Remember this. Temptation is a brochure. What it really offers you is a wasteland, not a paradise. Can you rewind back to Eve in that moment? Eve, here's the deal. Read the brochure. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's going to be better for you. Do you want to start the clock and tell me how long it was better for her? Click, go. When do I stop? Immediately? <laughs> All right, so maybe ours is going to be better for us for a short run, maybe. Maybe when we're blind. But when your eyes get open and you start putting fig leaves on yourself and hiding from the very God who made you and being kicked out of the garden and miserably having to toil and sweat every day and, and dealing with strife between husbands and wives and watching your children kill each other, you still want to tell me the brochure was a good one? It promised you paradise. And it brought you into a wasteland. Remember, temptation is a brochure. It makes all kinds of promises. It's not going to deliver on them. Those nasty words in Timothy are waiting for us. There are snares, ruin, destruction. That's what waits behind the brochure. So I've got to remember these things. God has called something good, and it wasn't that. Or he'd have given me that. Let's stand up together. Lord, we certainly know that your word is a, is a, is a big volume of revelation. There's so much that you have said about so many things. But Lord, these things strangely capture our attention because you set our focus on them in prayer. Lord, you made us aware that our daily need before you, before this world is to deal with temptation, to face it in this place, to deal with it uniquely in our own lives. So God, I, I pray today that this would not be the only study that we do on temptation, but God, we would become experts in this field. Of all the things that we're going to know in the year 2016, God, make us to know these things. Because we live in this environment and the brochure of temptation comes to us in the mail on a regular basis. And it's inviting when it gets into the right category in our hearts, Lord. It's, it's, it's alluring and it entices us and we're already inclined toward it. God, what we see here today is the God who called something else good. Lord, you, you are the only one wise. You are the only one truly good. So what you have promised us outside of the temptation zone is what's good for us. God, we want to we know it. We want to embrace it. We want our hearts to treasure that. So God, make us a people that when temptation comes to visit, we are experts. We know something in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I bless you guys. Y'all have an awesome week.